Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Closing the Loop with Ananas. Um, today we're talking to yet another favorite teacher of ours, Dr. Sultan Ismail. He is a star in the field of soil ecology and he has done pioneering research on earthworms and their role in waste management through soil bioremediation. Um, he was also honored with a doctorate in science by the University of Madras in 2001 for all his contributions. He has been a mentor figure for several farming communities, non-profits and women's organizations and has really contributed to a lot of success stories across the nation. But he is especially passionate about teaching children and the youth. And he does it with so much enthusiasm and zeal for life that we're always looking forward to it. Um, and so we have a lot of questions to ask him and he has a lot to say. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy this podcast. Hello. Hi. 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 Hello, Dr. Oh my God, three people. I am yeah. <laughs> didn't want to miss out. <laughs> I thought yeah. I was yeah. going to be shot by one. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's coming from three sides now. Three, different sides. three dimensional. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Good to see you all. Yeah. How are you all? Lovely very to good. see you. We're doing yeah. very well. Doing yeah. Very well. Thanks yeah. again so much for doing this. Yeah. Um, all right. yeah. yeah we're Today really I don't have any other commitment, just uh, my own garden and terrace garden. Okay. Nice. Oh, nice. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, nice. So you do, you have a terrace garden also there? I have a huge garden as well as a terrace garden in my small space. Okay. 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 Oh, lovely. Um, nice. Yeah. So uh, we, um, yeah, like we said, we're just really happy to have you on. We've been uh, having these series of conversations and uh, we actually have um, seen you talk, uh, Sancho and I have seen you talk at the NPC, NPC and, yeah. and at the IPC and uh, just found that your talks were really some of the most engaging that we would um, that we saw there. And uh, we've always noticed that like whenever you're speaking that the halls are just packed and like you have such a sort of a presence about you. So we're really happy to be talking to you today. Um, so uh, we actually just wanted to start just understanding a bit more about uh, your background. Um, so you ha have now uh, many decades of experience. Wall behind me. Yeah, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you mean the wall behind me. Make it right, yeah, not too serious yeah. to me. <laughs> It's good. It's good if you cut through some of this sort of formality of these questions. That, that makes yeah, it all much true. more straightforward. <laughs> um, yeah, but basically, uh, we just wanted to know a bit more about you and uh, like how you got into this work. Because like we know that um, you first studied zoology, and now of course you're like a leading uh, researcher in soil ecology, and you also environmental education is a big part of your work. And so we wanted to know about your journey into it and. Um, yeah, what it is like the got you started in this line of work, basically. Yeah, interrupt me wherever you want. Absolutely sure. no problem. With me. Okay. And be very informal. Sure. Very, be very informal. Sure. Yeah, because okay. uh, uh, this voice. conversation, I want even uh, youngsters who watch it and uh, yeah. students who would be watching it to understand. Uh, okay. Not to get fixed up to something in life, but to have an open mind in life if you really want to progress. Oh, and it is no degree or a subject which makes you what you are. It's a passion for something which you want to do makes you what you are. These are very, very important in life. It's not the degree which gives you all the education. I always tell people that there are more knowledgeable people than me in this field. But uh, they confine the knowledge to themselves. And uh, that doesn't make sense. Unless you open up and reach people and communicate to them in a way they understand then there's no point in having any amount of knowledge in your skull. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Now, how I all started was I actually, after my school, yeah, I had a strong foundation thanks to my uh, St. Joseph of Cluny Pondicherry. I was born in Pondicherry. My dad was from Pondicherry. And uh, uh, I lost him when I was very young, when I was in class four. So it so happens that after school, I wanted to take up uh, sciences. And here again, I got 100% uh, in mathematics and only 48% in science. Uh, I got 100% in mathematics because I was very poor in mathematics. I was very afraid because my teacher used to frighten me that I will fail in mathematics. 
<laughs> when I came to college, I wanted an admission in science. My my principal of the college said, uh, "No, no, you are good in mathematics. You must take mathematics." I said, "No, no," because of fear, I studied it. I don't like it. <laughs> 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 Probably, I I wrote science in the language which I liked it, and uh, the examiner did not know what I wrote, so he gave me only forty eight percent. It doesn't make uh, difference to me. So I took up science, and among science, I preferred zoology. And uh, no, I, I took sciences, but in sciences, after that, for graduation, I preferred zoology because of a teacher. The teacher mm -hmm. was so good and so clear in expressing about zoology that I took a fancy for zoology. I joined my graduate program in zoology. It was general zoology. We also had botany and chemistry as subjects. And then gradually, I go into. I complete my graduation. I was student secretary for my final year, so my principal was fascinated. But I had financial limitations to go for higher education. But my principal was very particular that I must join MSc because uh, the course had just started in our college. So I joined uh, post graduation in zoology, and uh, it was zoology with fishery biology. So I studied fisheries. I studied about fishers, about the sea, everything. And then uh, after I finished my uh, post graduation, I was hunting for a job. When one day I went to college, and incidentally, again the same principal who guided me, he said, "Have you got a job?" I said, "No, not yet." He said, "Meet me before you go." So I went there, and he said, uh, "Sultan, there is a, a vacancy for a demonstrator's post in the department for six months. Would you like to take it over?" I said, uh, "With pleasure." So I joined the college, the same college where I studied as demonstrator in zoology. In those days, there was a post called as demonstrator where we used to assist the lecturers in the practical classes. Okay. So uh, okay. yeah, and uh, the management actually, I still remember the management secretary throwing the appointment order in front of me and saying, six months, don't come and disturb me after that." <laughs> <laughs> but nice. nature, nature had its own winds and fancies. Exactly after six months, one teacher from the department resigned. Mm. So I became a lecturer. Oh. 1975, oh. I became a lecturer. I, I continued with my post graduation. 78, there was a call under the faculty improvement program for those who would like to do MPhil or PhD. MPhil was a new course that was introduced then, and nobody was interested. So no competition. PhD, every senior member was fighting, I should go, you should go. I applied for MPhil. I got it. I did my MPhil. And MPhil I did in marine biology. So I studied marine ecosystems. I went into the harbor. I did worked on fowlers. I did a lot of work on boating. I, I did a lot of work on those aspects. How nature threw open these dimensions to me so that today I can interact with uh, all branches of uh, sciences so that it gives an opening. I, I was not focused. So yeah. I, I completed my MPhil. I came back to the department. That is where the turn of events happen now. I wanted to do my PhD, continue my PhD, and my supervisor, uh, my head of the department at the Madras University at that time, he said, uh, I'm sorry, I will not permit you to do PhD. He wanted to encourage somebody from his own native place. Fair enough. Uh, I, at that time, I felt very bad. It's OK. I can forgive him because it made me better. And uh, then I went to my supervisor and told him, sir, please take me part time because full time the professor is not permitting. I'm a teacher candidate part time. He said, no, you come as a full time candidate. I said, sir, I can't because I'm the only earning member for the family. And uh, I have to earn for my family and uh, I have to support my family. He said, I don't care. I said, I, said, I don't care. I walk. <laughs> <laughs> so behind all the time, there's a rebellious person also. You know, mm. like I came back to the department. I was sitting in my room. Uh, Kiri and all the youngsters, you know, like uh, both uh, Jamuna and uh, Himanshu, please understand. And also let all our viewers understand that I come back to my department. I, I joined back my department. I'm sitting in my room and one of my former students, uh, who worked with my head of the department, who was also the principal, who was also the principal. And he was busy, so I used to help his students for his for their projects. So that boy walks in and says, uh, sir, I'm sorry, I could not get a seat in the MPhil, but I'm interested in research. Can you help me with research? I said, I can help you, but I have to take permission from my head of the department. So I go to my head of the department and I, tell, uh, and, and I ask him, sir, your former student wants this help. Can I help him? He just looked at me and said, he, he had uh, studied in Canada. 
He looked at me and said, Sultan, this was my ambition for my department, that somebody should start research. Please proceed. Mm. While coming back, I saw a paper lying on the floor, a floor, a circular. I picked up the paper. It was a, it was a circular inviting paper for Ethological Society of India, ETHO, Ethos, Behavior, Behavior Sciences. So I saw that it was a seminar to be held in January 1981. So this is 1979-80, I had completed my MPhil. 80, I'm seated over there. And this boy has come. And I went and asked him, hey, guy, he has permitted. But would you like to do something in behavior? Because there's going to be a seminar. And then he, you know, like he looked at me uh, and said, sir, anything you want. Right? Just then my lab assistant was crossing my room. I said, because for behavior, I need live specimens. So I called him and said, uh, do you have any live specimens in the department? He said, sir, we have earthworms. Mm. Ah. <laughs> and I on that day said, I am a marine biologist. I am a fishery biologist. I won't have touched the worms. I said, it's OK. Let me start with earthworms. We started working on earthworms. So I had to standardize them. I wanted a culture because I wanted a regular thing. So I started standardizing the culture. We standardized the culture for growing earthworms. We came out with new things. We worked on the behavior that slowly moved into uh, uh, ecological adaptations. And as I was progressing, uh, one of my professors, uh, two of my professors, Professor Sanjeev Raj and Professor Antakrishnan, they both were very particular that I must tell this to the people. And uh, they said, go and inform. The Hindu newspaper wants uh, you. Why don't you go and talk to them? I said, I will not go to any press. If they are interested, let them come and meet me. And then he called up the Hindu and gave the phone in my hand. And uh, Mr. Vagatramani, who was the agriculture correspondent, said, yeah, please come. We have, <laughs> you, don't, you don't worry at all. The moment you come and tell the reception, I'll come running down and take you. We will not make you wait. I said, okay, fine, fair enough. I had a bike. Mm -hmm. I went uh, from there to the Hindu newspaper. And it was released for the world on the entire procedures of multiplying local earthworms. The same that, uh, that came out in 1992, actually, because I was standardizing the whole procedure. 92 uh, October. October, yeah, November, October, November, it was published. The next month, it was published in Tamil. And the next month, it was published in all the languages of the country. Okay. Oh, we started wow. working with the people. People wanted it. Public wanted it. We put up exhibitions we, wherever possible. Certain very important incidents happened. I, I, my student, Dr. Annie Grace, who was my one of my former PhD students, she and my field assistant, Ramesh, and I, we were participating in an exhibition in YMCA, we were invited, actually. We had not taken the stall. We were invited to showcase and talk to people about waste management and things. And I had this box, and I was demonstrating. And one elderly man came in. And he said, what are you doing? I said, sir, vermicompost. All nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, how are you doing? I said, this is no, all nonsense. <laughs> I said, uh, can you tell me why, sir? No, you see. There was one article in the Hindu which was published. You follow that procedure, you will get it. You don't try to do anything new. So I took that article and showed it to him. Do you mean this, sir? He said, yes. I said, I am that fellow. He said, oh, wonderful. <laughs> I got wonderful <laughs> results. Please continue. <laughs> I started studying from uh, word to mouth, and uh, students started joining. I started guiding students for PhD on this topic. 20 students for PhD have produced so far, and a lot of publications, a lot of things, scientific evidences. Because I strongly believe that whatever we talk should have scientific evidence. Passion alone doesn't work. Mm -hmm. If you have to fight with people, if you have to put your things in front of people. So that was the thing. And uh, after PhD, I wanted to do my DSC. That is the highest degree of the university. So I just uh, highest degree of the university and uh, uh, for that uh, there was a sort of a um, problem that is uh, uh, I was afraid to submit it to Madras University. I, I did my post graduation from uh, I did a lot of postdoctoral work in the uh, University of Lancaster UK uh, and other places but still I was afraid because Madras University is a very conservative university. So I went to my uh, my own PhD supervisor Professor Murthy. A uh, gem, a uh, gem, uh, you know, like uh, I, I imbibed a lot from them. We learned from our supervisors in those days as to how your supervisor should be. Right. 
and uh, yeah. he was a gem. I went and told him, sir, I want to do this. He said, do it. He himself was not a DSC. He was a PhD. But he said, do it. Mm -hmm. But when I said, sir, I'm afraid to do it in Madras University, I will do it from some other university. He said, no, all your degrees are from Madras University. If you want, face it. Else, don't do it. I said, OK, I'll do it. And I got into the first attempt in 2001. I got my DSC. Uh, lots of students, okay. lots of work, lots of uh, things have come out. And feel happy today that uh, we have contributed uh, enough information. I've always had a passion to talk to children. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to make small, simple experiments. In fact, uh, one of these experiments related to vermic compost, uh, only a small school things got me a commendation from CASME, this Commonwealth Association for Science, Technology, and Mathematics Educators Award in the UK. And uh, then uh, started working with children, started creating simple experiments. Government of India got interested, and uh, Department of Science and Technology always used to invite me as a resource person. One day, they pulled me up and made me sit and said, look here, man, you, we cannot clone you. <laughs> can you put all these thoughts into your book? I said, fine, I can do it. They said, we need 100 experiments. I said, this brain cannot produce 100 experiments. <laughs> he said, no, you can form a team. I said, OK. Uh, but he said, you must take people from different parts of the country. I said, it will be my choice or your choice. He said, your choice. I said, fine, fair enough. Then I will do it. So then we collected and we prepared 100 science experiments, which we called it as simple tasks, great concepts which is there online, www.simpletaskgreatconcepts.wordpress.com. Uh, any child can download and do 100 science experiments for children, which oh, became a massive nice. exercise and uh, gradually got involved with so much that uh, uh, two years back, the government of Tamil Nadu put me as a curriculum committee member, one of the eight members who revised the entire syllabus for the state. Oh, and wow. I had to supervise the state government's zoology books on how they should be. So what I mean to tell the next generation, my younger ones, my students, and the youngsters who are watching, take up with passion, do it with passion. Marks don't help you, passion helps you in life. Yes. <laughs> That's uh, quite an illustrious uh, background, if I must say. So is there, was there any particular, um, did you have any sort of a big influence in your life? Was there a particular person or there was, were there any great lessons in your life that you learned while growing up uh, during this? This is what I, I keep telling a lot of people, you know, like especially because I move with a lot of students. Every year I address at least about uh, uh, maximum of 10,000 children every year I address somehow by God's grace. and. Uh, uh, most of them ask me this question, who is your role model? And I tell them that the best role model is uh, go back to your house and look in the mirror. That's the role model. <laughs> any, other person, any other person in life, I can respect for their scholarship. I have people whom I like, my, my own supervisor, Professor Murthy, or Professor Moedin, who first allowed me, or Dr. Fanul, who first invited me to register. Uh, there are so many wonderful people whom I have high respect for their scholarship. But if I make them as a role model, I will not try to overrule and go above them because they are my limit. So if I put myself as a role model, then I have no limits. So my, 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 my dad has had a wonderful influence, even though he passed away when I was very young, because lots of poor people have spoken very kind words about him. How all he encouraged and he fought cases free. He was a barrister. In fact, he had studied in Cairo in those days, and he was the expert in French law. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Pondicherry. So, you know, like um, uh, he was a wonderful influence because after his death, many people used to tell that he used to work. Here. In fact, uh, when I traveled by train on one particular day, now, oh, would you call him a role model? Yes, you can. Because, you know, like I'm traveling, I have to go back to Pondicherry after my school, and uh, my own relatives did not uh, allow, take me with them to drop me in my hometown because it was out of the way. The next day was school. I was afraid of getting caned because in those days, if you don't go on the first day, you get a caning. Right, so I was afraid, and uh, the only th uh, thing was the train which used to leave at ten thirty in the night from Madras Egmore and uh, to reach Pondicherry early morning at five five thirty, and then I can. My house was opposite to the station. We'll go have a wash and then rush up to the school. And I go into the train. There's I, I am seated near the window. There's another person in the corner of that seat in third class. In those days, we used to have 
first class, second class, and third class. On the opposite seat, there was one person and another person in the corner. This person opposite to me, the person who dropped me at the station, I was in class 11 at that time. In those days, it was class 11 when pre university. And this gentleman told me, don't talk to anybody, just keep your mouth shut and go and reach your place. Because first time I'm driving overnight alone as a kid. And uh, But the, as soon as the train started moving, this gentleman started asking me, uh, where are you going? I hesitatingly said Pondicherry. Then he said, uh, where do you stay? And the moment he, he, I said opposite to the station, he asked me, who are you? I said, I am Ismail Avaka's son. Avaka is advocate in French. So Ismail Avaka's son. And uh, he suddenly stood up. He said, uh, you are his son? I said, yes. He said, I am a laborer from the Swadeshi cotton mills. He has fought cases for us free and got us all the benefits. And immediately he asked the other person seated on my seat to get up and sit in that seat. And they three shared the seat. He took his towel, wiped up my seat and said, you sleep and come. I will wake you up when you reach Pondicherry. Wow. He is a role model. Mm -hmm. And in fact, today, of course, the world knows me by my dad's name. My name is not Ismail. My name is not Ismail. My dad's name is Ismail. Mm -hmm. but the world knows me only as Ismail. Because when I was studying, I used to write my name as I Sultan Ahmed. Because normally in India, we don't have the surname concept. Mm -hmm. We put yeah. our name as an initial. So we, I, I used to write it, I Sultan Ahmed, and all the students used to make fun of me. What man, I Sultan Ahmed? We know that you are Sultan Ahmed. <laughs> <laughs> so I said the initial to the end. I said Sultan Ahmed, I, again, they started making fun of me when I joined the new school, sixth standard, after Clooney, I went to Pissimna. And uh, then uh, I used to write my full name, Sultan Ahmed Ismail, big name. And uh, one teacher in my class six, he said, I can't be writing this name like that. Your name is S. A. Ismail. So my name became my initials and my dad's name became my name. Uh, <laughs> by that time, he was no more. He was no mm -hmm. more. So mm -hmm. I am known by my dad's name throughout the world. And that's uh, I feel it as a honor and a privilege. Wow. Sounds like he was a special man. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, um, yeah, uh, let me just think of what because it's covering quite a lot of things. I wanted to know, um, yeah, so, you know, just going back to teaching for a second, uh, mm. we're also, we also conduct workshops and sort of we're in the sort of starting out in this journey. I mean, we've been doing it a couple of years now, but you as someone who's been, you know, you say you, you address 10,000 children every year and, you know, you're obviously teaching a lot of people. Um, do you have any advice like i mean if when you were first starting out teaching is there something that you would have liked to have known um or you know are there any is there any advice that you can give us that you feel you know is a good way of um inspiring people getting information across yeah just about teaching in general when i was in class eight this is an advice to all those people who would like to be teachers in life and communicators in life uh, Mr. Charles Kolandaraj, a teacher from somewhere else, joins our school. And he starts teaching mathematics in class 8. Nice person, short person with big glasses, thick mush, but with a hoarse voice. And uh, suddenly, one fine day, he says, Hey, Sultan, hey, Vaidyanathan. Vaidyanathan was my classmate. Both of you have a good voice. Uh, why don't you start oratory? And why don't you go into debating? Uh, we said, uh, what is it, sir? We don't know in class eight. He says, uh, shall we form an oratory society in this school? Anybody else who would like, will, uh, willing to join with these two people? But I want you two to join. But uh, any, anybody else? Another four students lifted their hands. So six of you, we will start a society. But you will have to stay back from 4 PM to 5 PM. In those days, school was from 10 AM to uh, eight, uh, 9 AM to 4 PM. So 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., you have to stay back, maybe twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We said, OK, sir. What we, we used to go home, and I used to stay opposite to the railway station. We used to play Gilly Danda or Latu or uh, one of those things in the Matti. So I said, OK, fine, we'll stay back. And uh, he started teaching us debate. He would, and uh, luckily for me, what happened was he will throw open a topic, and unfortunately, Vaidyanathan will always say, I'm going to speak for the topic. So I used to speak <laughs> against the topic. And against the topic, you have to be more convincing with points. 
Yeah. So that gave me an added advantage. And mm -hmm. uh, he taught me how to modulate, how to communicate, how to go in for debating. From there, I come into college. Into college, I come, I continue my debates for the college. One fine day, and of course, Mr. You know, like uh, there was one professor, Dr. Dharmaraj, who had come back from uh, UK, who was a team member of uh, one of the re leading veterinary research in the UK in those times. He completed, he came back, he became a UGC professor and got attached to our college to teach genetics. A wonderful teacher. Now, uh, I was practicing for the Darwin Rolling Shield for uh, Madras University. And uh, uh, I was practicing and in the hall uh, one day before, as I was practicing, my previous teacher used to say, in those four five minutes, one important point, you have to bang the table. So uh, I was banging the table when he entered in. He always used to carry a pipe with him, a bald man. He used to come in the standard Herald car of those days. With a pipe, he looked at me and said, why the hell did you bang the table? <laughs> <laughs> that was a very important point. And my teacher said that I must bang the table. He said, Sultan, yes, you must bang. Not the table, but with your voice. <laughs> and he taught me the art of giving a pause and then communicating with a bang and how to reach people and things. And Mr. Charles' teaching was wonderful tips for those who would like to go in for communication, including our own teams. He told me two very important points in life. One, he said, Sultan, stand up, speak, and have the audience with you in two minutes. Mm -hmm. If you can't have the audience with you, shut up and sit down. You have no business to bore others. <laughs> <laughs> very good. The second thing he said was, never exhaust yourself unless it is a seminar. If you're doing a public talk, take it to the pitch and stop when the audience wants more. If you exhaust, people will forget you. Mm -hmm. So always leave something behind. Don't exhaust yourself in front of your audience. You know, like uh, these are wonderful tips. So I request yeah. teachers to identify talent. I request students to have confidence in their teachers when they mold them. And also youngsters today, you have a lot of confidence. So you can, you can. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. That's how all happened. Communication started. We started talking on the roads, Namalwar, I, and all those people. We used to stand on the roads at 11 o'clock in the night and talk to people, farmers, all those people to go in for organic farming and all those things. Yeah, that used to be fun. When fun. Started, um, yeah, just reminded me of another thing I wanted to ask. Is it like you said that uh, you sort of uh, started working with earthworms quite like it just sort of happened because you know the, yeah. the earthworms were available and then you started studying them but in those days when you first started out was studying um soil ecology and the soil food web and that whole side of uh soil life was that really very common or was were you i mean yeah what was <laughs> thoughts on that in those days in those days the thought was soil is a mineral matter yeah uh, yeah and, and uh, uh you know like uh uh, this chance uh, working with earthworms, 1978-79. And then my, my fascination to do my research in earthworms, because my PhD thesis was on earthworms. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my research started in 1979-80. I registered for my PhD in 80. I got my de degree uh, completed in 83, minimum time. I got my thesis in 84. But, um, but the thing is, uh, I wanted a book, especially Fauna of British India by Stephenson. Published in 1923. So I went to Madras University, has a beautiful library, old library, thanks to the library. I went on searching for the book, and finally my, I could locate Fauna of British India by Stephenson, 1923, Oligo Pita, that is on Earthworms. I took that book, a bound book, brought it down, I opened it. The pages were still fused. Not a single person has touched the book, which was purchased in 1923. Till oh 1979. Oh. <laughs> that's that's how niche the topic was. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I I was the first one to tear open those sheets and then open wow. them up and beat up. So wow. no work had been done. Of course, there was some uh, work done by Professor Gates uh, of survey of uh, various earthworms in India, which were already quoted in this book. Uh, Stephenson's book and uh, incidentally working on earthworms 
there, there were my my predecessors were there who were working in India. We had Professor Dr. Julka, who was a taxonomist working for the Zoological Survey of India. Uh, we had um, um, a group with Professor R. V. Krishnamurti, Radha Kale, and Kubra Banu working from Bangalore University. We have Professor Madhav C. Dash and his students, Senapati, and uh, one more person working from Sambalpur University. So, in those days, these were the four centers. Uh, basically, who were known to start working on earthworms, major centers. The rest were all one or two projects here and there they were doing. Uh, incidentally, Dr. Julka still is active as a taxonomist. But the thing is, you know, like he confined more to taxonomy and helping people identify species. Uh, Professor Radha Kale was, uh, he herself, she herself claims for having brought in Eudralist Eugenie from Germany, which I always fought against it but today it has become a pest uh, that particular species because uh, we used to work with perionics uh, which is our endemic variety okay. and or she we, we never used to encourage exotic varieties till this was introduced by the bangalore uh, group and uh, professor dash became vice chancellor and uh, so he could not uh, actively participate but his student senapati used to do it but we were very vocal Vocal in the sense, anybody can walk in and take information from us. There was no barrier. And thanks to my college, new college, uh, where I studied, I was working. And uh, I wanted to set up a demonstration center. It was 1990 something, 91, 92. I wanted to establish that center, which was actually came in the press after that. So uh, I went and asked my management whether they can give me some money to set up. My management said, uh, what would be the estimate? And in 1992, the estimate was 22,000 rupees. That is big money. So I went and submitted that paper to the cabin, and he looked at it and laughed. I said, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> I don't know what happened to him at that moment. He said, no, proceed. Hmm. And it became a <laughs> center, an international center later. So, you know, like right things happened at the right moment, especially as uh, Coelho says, when you want, things happen. Yeah, so uh, so you've been an educator in this uh, environmental sector for a long time. I would and say you teacher, said that, not educator. Mm. Yeah, teacher. Mm. And uh, and you said that uh, it is actually fun for you to talk to farmers. Mm. Um, my, my question is that, I mean, in my personal experience, I've not I've, I've found it quite challenging to communicate these things to farmers, especially because backing it up with science uh, is not very, uh, you can't easily um, uh, convey that to them, right? And also, even, even as these students and stuff, I don't know how much agri-courses go into soil ecology and soil life. So there needs to be a, some amount of uh, open-mindedness and the uh, willingness to unlearn some of these concepts that have been like drilled in our head. So, uh, so there should be some kind of challenges or struggles that you go through, right? Or it does, does, are there things that frustrate you basically when you're teaching uh, these things? To be, to be honest, a good teacher is one who is prepared to unlearn and relearn. Uh, actually, learning is easy. Unlearning is difficult. Unlearning is difficult because the concepts nailed in our heads are so strong that we had to fight against it. Mm -hmm. So whatever I'm talking today with confidence in most of these seminars is the knowledge I have gained from the farmers and not from the textbooks. The, the thing is, uh, uh, I, I go down to that level. I don't want them to rise to my level okay. in communication with the farmers. My challenge was go and talk to them in their level of understanding. There's no point if I go and tell him, what is the pH of your soil? He would say, what is this P and what is this H? Right? So talk to them in their, in their language. You know, like I, I, for a simple thing, I would say. Uh, I, I used to tell farmers, uh, you go for soil analysis. But next time when you go over there, please allow your cattle to move around and let the cattle put the dropping. Just leave the droppings there. After two, three days, just go and observe them. If the dropping is becoming flat and dry, there is something wrong with your soil. There is no moisture content. There is no microbial activity. There is no organismic activity. If you're, if the dung is breaking into small crevices and pieces and becoming beautiful structures, 
then just turn it over. You will send a horde of microarthropods. You may even send earthworm burrows over there. So uh, these are the simple techniques through which I started talking to them. And the one thing is, uh, you know, like I, I always go and tell them that you have been disappointed by a large number of people who, in quotes, call themselves a scientist. So please don't trust me as well. Okay. Why should they trust us? They need not mm. trust us. They are the people who finally work. The problem with most of the communicators who go to the farmers go with the things thinking that I know, so I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm coming to share with you. Okay. And I, even for organic farming, when I talk to farmers, I tell them, you have a chemical farm, please proceed. Do it. Do it. I have no problem. But my humble request, if you have about three acres, four acres, one hundred or a small corner or two cents, ten cents, can you try the way I want you to try? But on certain conditions that you will maintain the accounts, you will maintain the ledger book, you will understand how much goes in, how much comes out, and finally, what is the profit? And promise me that you will not concentrate on how much crop you are producing, but how much of financial benefit you are getting. The problem is when we approach, we forget that they have a mindset, how much crop I am producing. Because most of the modern universities became crop centric, not farmer centric. So yeah. how much yield you are getting is recognized, not the labor, not the cost, not the problems the farmer goes through. What I talk to them is, you are comfortable. Are you happy? Is your family happy? How much money did you put in? How much did you harvest? You have a profit, be happy with it. You are not born to feed the world. You are born to live happily. Come to that one day, then the world will respect you. Yeah. Otherwise, the world will use you. That's the only difference. Mm -hmm. That's the only difference. So uh, that people like it. So like, for example, one simple example I'll tell you. Vandana and I went to Dehradun. Uh, long back, I'm telling you about some 25, 30 years back. I still have the picture with me. Uh, we reached the place a bit late because of the traffic. It was a very cold winter and I was heavily clad. Uh, South Indian, you can understand. When the yeah. temperature was 19 in uh, Chennai, we put on our sweater. <laughs> <laughs> so I had that uh, cap, uh, which we commonly, mockingly call it as a monkey cap and uh, all the leather jacket. And she was also well clothed, and all the farmers were well clothed, and they were prepared a haven, and they were waiting. Haven, Kiri, you know, you know what a haven is, and all the firework was going on, and uh, they took us, and they made us sit over there. And I was mistaken as a Brahmin gentleman, and so I was made to sit in front of the haven. They put a th sacred thread on me also, and started with the practice. After the whole thing was over, after all the hymns were over, everything was over. Uh, the organizer came and held my hand and said, I'm sorry, I did not know who you were. I said, no, you got caught now. I'm going to punish you for this. I'm definitely going to punish you for this. He said, what? <laughs> no, that punishment will be in my public talk, not here. And in my public talk, I made it very clear that I sat in the haven, and in the haven, you people all prayed that you're going to protect all the jivan jantu. You either do the haven or use the pesticides. You yeah, can't yeah. use the pesticides that you are going to protect all the Jeevan Jantu and also do the Havan. That went straight into their minds and we had wow. a lot of people immediately accepting for organic farm. Wow. Wow. You know, uh, opportunities. This is what mm -hmm. is coming where you try mm -hmm. to pick up from the local resource. Don't go with the predetermined mm -hmm. mind that mm -hmm. I would talk this to the farmers to make mm -hmm. them understand that I okay. have no, I don't have anything. Mm -hmm. Take Super. from them based on the local resources. Because success of uh, non-chemical farming is only low external input sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. Those who talk that everything is zero, I don't believe in zero. I don't believe in that word at all. There yeah. is no zero in life. There is always a sort of a balance which tills here and there. Right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. whether it is permaculture or organic farming or biodynamic farming or natural farming or zero budget natural farming, whatever you call it as, mm -hmm. everything has everything there but at the same time the farmer may require something we, hmm. we forget that the farmer also his and his family needs food to eat now, everything what he needs to eat may not grow on his own field yeah. he is, his farming may be sustainable but his life cannot be sustainable so try to aim at low external input sustainable living yeah that, that should be our aim in life that is where we are failing 
we are we are seriously thinking that everything will get balanced as though in a, uh, uh, you know like only people with an ocd can think about it the left side should balance the right side it's not possible at all yeah. <laughs> true <laughs> But uh, on that, I mean, I really like this not born to feed the world, but born to live happily uh, about the farmer. Uh, so do you um, do you think we're moving in terms of the awareness and in terms of how these things pan out? Do you think we're moving to a better place right now or do you think we are worsening by time? Uh, we are uh, we we always try to move towards a better place, but the policies try to work against it because they are afraid that the farmers will move to a better place. Mm. Yeah, you know, like uh, this is not uh, nothing new. For the past five years, I think even in the NPC, I had shown that slide. Even yeah. before this, new bills had come up. Yeah. You know, like uh, the rain is falling on the soil. The water belongs to the soil. You go and keep a pot and collect it. Then the water belongs to you. But I gave you that pot. So whom does the water belong to? You have no other pot. This I have been yeah. asking for years together for people. And I was yeah. saying that. People are moving towards corporatization where mm. our farmer, his field mm. and his labor, but somebody mm. else is gaining the benefits. That's what is realizing now. Mm -hmm. right. mm. what is now? Now, unless we give the sovereignty to the farmer, the right to the farmer, uh, up that he grows, it is his will, yes. But how can you expect a farmer, you know, like uh, even I, I, you know, like in, in here, Tiruvalu district, neighborhood of Chennai, um, they grow all these jasmine flowers and other things. Now, these flowers have to go to the market for sale. Every farmer harvests about two bags, for example. Now, if all the farmers go over there, they have no time to again do the reharvest over here. So by turns, one farmer collects all the bags and goes. Hmm. Because this farmer has to stay back over there to continue the next day's work. And we policy makers, we think that a farmer can travel all the way from uh, Chennai, from here, uh, Tanjaur, harvest something and carry to Delhi to sell and come back at a good price. Is it possible? Mm -hmm. So somebody else is going to get benefited. Yeah. So why, why is it that we don't look through a farmer's viewpoint and we look through a policy viewpoint? And yeah. uh, mo most of the beautiful organizations, and especially my uh, faith in the youth today. Uh, really, I find a lot of youth coming up, uh, you know, like and uh, th th their idea of uh, um, carbon utilization or whatever you can call it as that promoting the local markets, promoting the local farmers, are also getting into farming has been mm -hmm. a good part of an initiative which is happening nowadays, which is a welcome sector. And in fact, yeah. as part of the Tamar curriculum committee, I know that uh, in our own textbooks, even at a young class, we have introduced topics related to agriculture or farming or what a child can do at the home and the gardening and things mm -hmm. like that. So oh, that we start initiative. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. Is that quite recent or that's been happened? It's just two years, two years, just two, two years. years. Oh, my Amazing. God. Two years now, really good and there's a, there's the book. Uh, the, the book has all the informations on uh, organic inputs. Books have, of course, we have to also put on genetic engineering and things like that because it's a science book. But we also mm -hmm. include about what is organic farming, what are all these components. We have a picture mm -hmm. of Navalvar also over there, and I mm -hmm. had the shock of my life when the final print came. I saw my own picture also there in the text. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we might be jumping around from one topic to the other. Yeah, do bit. whatever you want. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm um, one and thing, I uh, <laughs> want to get your thoughts on this because uh, your knowledge about soil and your interest in it is that uh, we keep coming up with this question about, um, you know, these soilless growing techniques like uh, hydroponics, hydroponics, and aquaponics, aquaponics and, all the ponics. Um. And all those, yeah, all those ponics. And I personally find myself being quite um, quickly sort of like biased against them because I find that they're very high input and, and uh, but I'm trying to sort of like be a little more open-minded about it because I recognize that maybe in urban situations and all that. But just from your perspective, like what do you think of, what do you think of these anything, techniques? Anything, anything fashionable and uh, expensive 
is mm. usually uh, appreciated immediately <laughs> by the industry and by the people. Yes. Uh, it's it's uh, quite an interesting feature. I'm not against any technique, but is it viable? Is the mm. biggest uh, mm. Hydroponics. Hydroponics, good, very good. Uh, my, uh, my wishes to you guys. But can everybody put up a shed of that expenses? Can everybody put up a maintenance? And moreover, you cannot grow all sorts of crops. In hydroponics, you have good legumes. Can uh, you have this uh, uh, leafy vegetables can be grown? Some cherry tomatoes can be grown, and things like that, which have a yeah. high end value. If you are doing it, you do it, but don't try to impose it on my country and on my people. That has mm -hmm. been my right. Yeah, aquaponics yeah. is reliable, uh, relatively better because in aquaponics you don't use chemicals because it is a fish which multiplies and uh, excretes, and that excreta goes away as fertilizer, and that is able to support it. But both these techniques cannot replace our soil or its agriculture. It's impossible. It's impossible. And um, uh, people who are making notes and uh, always giving some sort of uh, advertisements, it's high investment uh, is required. And uh, how far is going to be sustainable is a question mark. It can be a fancy one or two crops if some of the government bodies, some funding agencies on public money, if you can take a loan, and then even if you can declare insolvency, then it is fair enough, you can try it. Mm, but okay. otherwise, uh, to a large extent in my, because our agriculture system is entirely different. Mm -hmm. the, the, the problem is we try to look at the West for everything, for everything. Yeah, right. And the biggest blunder with it, even for manufacturing of cars, we started looking at the West, not the East. Mm -hmm. And we look at the East, then itself, we would have gotten in for Honda and Toyota long back. Uh, now, mm -hmm. what, what happens is, uh, some one small incident, if you permit me, I would like to tell you that uh, your observation, if you go to any fields, uh, farmer's fields, you will find that the fields have these small, small partitions and there will be ridges on which people walk. Okay. Now, yeah. many people think that this is uh, required because people have to walk and go to the field, so they use it. And uh, one very important politician from my country, I don't want to name anybody because I don't want to enter politics, goes mm -hmm. to US and Israel, comes back and says that all these are fellows are stupid in India. They're, these farmers, they have put these ridges and they have to remove those ridges because in US and Israel, the tractor goes for hundreds of, uh, uh, you know, like feet and yards and then mm -hmm. comes back. And mm -hmm. these ridges are not permitting plowing. There mm -hmm. was a major research. Incidentally, I was examiner for the thesis which was submitted by Dr. Huck and his students from Calicut University where they studied the entire beautiful migration of soil organisms. Paddy cultivation or any cultivation which requires water stagnation in the soil, during the period of water stagnation, all these microarthropods and worms, they move away to the side ridges and stay over there. As mm. the water level goes down and becomes a slush, they come back, start operating, produce fertilizers for the next generation. Wow. 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 That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, amazing migration of microarthropods and organisms which work over there. And short mm -hmm. just looking at a Western way of doing, people immediately yeah. say, why in India the ridges? For walking, you want a ridges? It is not for walking. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is where I want to be very clear that ancient mm -hmm. wisdom is different from modern knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, one thing, all this sort of thinking went into my head because long back I was uh, going to Kerala for uh, discussion. And one mm -hmm. gentleman who were there who was working with water systems, he told me a story. He said he was doing a program for some government project in Orissa. And I believe there was a pond and uh, they had to increase the capacity of the pond. They had to increase the capacity of the pond. So they mm -hmm. had gone there and uh, the villages would not allow them to come because uh, they were repulsive. So they put the tent or something near the pond itself. They were staying there. It used to rain, it used to go, but they did not know what to do because they did all the geographical and the geo indicators. If you increase the diameter of the pond, then the water evaporation rate will be faster than the collection rate. So it doesn't make sense. If they go deeper, they have saline water down that will infiltrate and the water will get spoiled. They do not know what to do. They have taken up a project and they were. <laughs> doing nothing one day an elderly lady elderly woman of that village gets mm -hmm. wrecked you know what the hell these chaps are doing over there so she comes and says what the hell are you doing man then they say this is our problem you could have come and asked me <laughs> here in this area when it rains 
water mm-hmm. goes and stagnates three feet above the pond level. So you can mm-hmm. see a parapet of about two feet more. So two feet more water will be available for all of us. And the problem yeah. was, <laughs> that is wisdom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is wisdom. So these are the things which we are trying to ignore. In fact, uh, there are lots of people who are trying to collect this knowledge and put them into books. But whether it interests people is what is very important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah. 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 So how do you find that balance between, like, because, I mean, obviously you're also in quite an academic field and then, and then you're also going out into villages and talking, you know, into rural areas. And so how do you find that balance between, like, what you're learning and then unlearning and... You just spend a lot of time outside talking to people. Or, I don't know if that's a very direct question, but um, yeah, no, no, it's, it's yeah. a direct. Question. It's okay, you know, like uh, just like what Janini just uh, told me. You know, like yeah. uh, when she said uh, educator, I corrected her as teacher yeah. because educator gets confined to education. Teacher talks to mm. everybody. That's mm. the reason I corrected her. Right, and. and um, you wouldn't believe that when uh, the new college, I left the college in 2001 for my personal reasons. And I was busy with uh, teaching people. In 2004, they forced me to come and start the Department of Biotechnology. Okay. Uh, in the college for the postgraduate mm-hmm. course, MSc in Biotechnology. So mm-hmm. I had freedom. Mm-hmm. I had the freedom. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, I designed the syllabus. Okay. And for the first time, MSc Biotechnology, students were studying about Vermi compost, Vermi wash, Panjagavya, Gunapasena, mm-hmm. all those things in theory and practice as part of the syllabus. Mm-hmm. Part of the syllabus right? mm-hmm. So it, 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 it gave me an added advantage. So then I made it a point that every year these students should go to the field and, and see what's happening in the farm. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the, these, these were the advantages which I could bring in in my education system itself. And uh, I always made the children understand that uh, be humble and try to learn from people. That's most mm-hmm. important. That's most important. And they have to do their own projects. And my students' projects were not based on, uh, uh, you know, like uh, or the, the results, but on the content. And all my PhD students, their topic, should have a chapter on social relevance. Otherwise, I used to tell them, you can go and work with somebody else. Mm-hmm. Wow. So as, as a teacher, if we can, all can work on it, it's not the mm-hmm. project, thing, but it's finally how it's going to reach people. Mm-hmm. I, I had the surprise of my life when one of my students, incidentally, today is her birthday, I must call her up. She is now associate professor in Japan, Dr. Radha. In, in one of her projects, you know, like um, it was something wonderful. She used to uh, get 500 kilograms of waste every time for every experiment, half a ton. Wow. At, at, that, time, at that time, one mm. leading institution, again, I don't want to name them because they mm. get all the money from the government of India. One leading institution invited me for a discussion on composting. I went to the lab. I was taken inside the lab. And they were handing, having a small glass beaker in which there was 50 grams of uh, waste with 20 grams of cow dung and 50 ml of water with two electrodes studying composting process. Oh, my God. So when it it, it can be a good publication, I don't deny. But when it Mm. is translated into reality or into practice, it will Mm. not function. So Mm -hmm. unfortunately, most of our research, I'm not blaming any institution or individuals here, but the way people look at it is, if I can do something in a lab, it will get translated. It cannot be translated unless it is field-oriented research. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So my humble request to youngsters who are doing research in these particular uh, directions is okay. that you please see to it that you also, you know, like uh, interact with uh, people, go and work in the field situation before you declare that it is feasible. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Uh, but you must have found it quite challenging, uh, even when you were growing up, to sort of translate this ancient wisdom uh, and meet the modern knowledge people, right? Because everything, because you are also interacting with the scientific community. And uh, I mean, isn't it for them, it needs to be objective and it needs to be uh, scientific and all of that. So how did you navigate that space uh, when you were engaging with 
most of our research had a scientific background but as you rightly said devanshu i was uh, once humiliated in the indian institute of science bangalore okay after my presentation for with an irreason unreasonable discussion by one of the professors who had attended that uh, seminar mm. that was the only incident in my entire career of 46 years that i have faced such a negative minded person who mm. had decided who had decided that he would not accept so it was not a discussion it was an argument right mm. Mm. i hope you know the difference between these two yeah. discussion yeah. discussion means what is right argument means who is right yes. i am right yeah so he wanted to prove that he was right so mm. we have to just pardon such people and go away second yeah. thing is when you are addressing people like uh, all this modern because unfortunately some professors i know they, they talk something on in a seminar but when mm. they come out they come and meet me personally and say Uh, professor what you said is exactly right but because i belong to this office i cannot be open oh <laughs> wow this yeah. has also happened to me yeah. yeah and sometimes our own people our own people who are talking on non chemical farming think that they are masters of everything mm mm-hmm. don't be over confident when you talk to people they have their own experiences respect their experiences also Right. Yeah. I, I still remember one major conference again organized by Vandana Shiva, Claude, everybody, and there I was talking about uh, this compost. And I'm always, you know, like I say that you try it; it may work. And I, I tell people that I worked with vermi compost, but I don't recommend vermi compost. Mm. You, you use it if you feel it useful. Do it; otherwise, throw it out. Mm. I don't mind about it. But getting worms in your soil is very good. Yeah. Vermi compost is different. Getting worms in your soil is different. Soil is different. Getting yeah. the worms back in your soil that is very important for me. Mm-hmm. This is one of the ways of breaking. You do some other way. I have no problem. You do biodynamic farming. You do BD five hundred, BD five zero one. You do uh, whatever you want. You are now uh, uh, Swash Palikar's uh, things or uh, Namarwar's techniques or any technique you do. Bring back the worms over there. But mm-hmm. after my lecture, one young lady again. I don't want to name her. Started mm-hmm. talking about pest repellents and was so strong and vehement that she could achieve. Mm-hmm. In the middle of the conversation talk, mm-hmm. one scientist from a uh, government department got up and started blasting, them, blasting. Them. He said, "Don't talk nonsense." Mm-hmm. Said, My respects to the professor who, in spite of his service, accepts that it may or may not, and you, with overconfidence, say it will. Mm. It will not because I have tried and it doesn't. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like don't be overconfident and put your pressure on people. Give them an option. You see, there are so many mechanisms. My my yeah. one day my one day fear is I am not at all worried about the chemical lobby. I am worried only about the so-called people who call themselves non-chemical and nature-friendly people. Nature-friendly mm. people are actually not human-friendly. <laughs> each, each one wants their own identity. What yeah. I'm going to say is whether you call it as permaculture or what you call it as uh, monoculture or you call it as organic farming or natural farming or BD farming, call it by any damn name, man. Yeah. They are all paths. They are all paths. Our destination mm-hmm. is non-chemical, non-poisonous farming. Yeah. So what my humble request to farmers is: if you're liking something from my portion, take it. If you're taking something you're liking from some other portion, also take it. So what? You yeah. are the yeah. Don't follow a leader. Yeah. Follow, a, follow, and reach a destination which is mm. good for you. So I am very clear. I am very, very clear. Anybody who criticizes about it, yes, please criticize. I have no problem at all. I will. I will. I will even criticize. So what? Yeah. So what? It, mm. it is something like you know Charles Dickens writes in his Pickwick Papers, beautiful book novel. Mm. He says when they go out, he tells his friends the elections are going on. Be careful. If you are with the buffs, shout with the buffs. If you are, you are with the blues, shout with the blues. And one of his friends, I think Mr. Winkle, asks if both of them come together. He says, "Shout with the majority." So you know. <laughs> 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 as long as it is non-chemical, it's okay. So what? So what? Mm. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like no need to uh, pick. Yeah. Only thing is, we have to create a lot of awareness because lots of chemicals are going into the circulation. Even seeds today. Uh, even normal seeds are being coated with uh, neonicotinoids, which is nasty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, even our own organic farmers may not know about it mm. because they may sometimes buy seeds from the market which has neonicotinoids in them. 
and uh, such things awareness people water water quality all these things have to be monitored and do you work on the policy side of things you were saying you don't really get involved in politics so uh, uh, are you involved in that i i don't directly confront but i mm. give my expressions wherever needed like for example in genetic modifications mm. uh, as a as a science student and as a former head of the department of biotechnology uh, do we really need them is a question mark which i have raised not today right from those days itself i have raised i have been a staunch uh, worker for heirloom seeds and working against GMO in spite of being the head of the Department of Biotechnology. Mm. Because uh, okay. I, I strongly believe that uh, whenever we teach our own students that uh, there is a hypothesis called as a one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Now it is called as a one gene, one amino acid hypothesis. They're going on diluting it further. So when I, when I, when I eliminate, cut and introduce a new gene over that, then the sequence of proteins produced would definitely be different from what it normally used to produce. So that yeah. can cause adverse reactions on a lot of human beings or organisms. Mm -hmm. The problem is most of the experiments are anthropocentric and not ecocentric. Again, to identify what happens to the local ecosystems by using such plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted to introduce golden rice, which was uh, genes taken from daffodils. But uh, we worked against it. Anyway, they were trying to smuggle again. BT cotton, you know what has happened with BT cotton. Yeah. The third edition has also come now. And uh, BT cotton was introduced as a non-edible crop when it is being consumed. Because in uh, Madurai, we make uh, cotton seed milk. Mm -hmm. And in Nagapatnam and Nagur, they prepare cotton seed halwa. Oh, okay. uh, so all this is consumed. It's not a non-edible crop, it's an edible crop. Moreover, uh, the oil seeds are being crushed, the cotton seeds, and oil is taken, maybe used for various purposes. Oil cakes are fed to the cattle, and that milk is being consumed. So long chain reactions have not been studied for these crops in our tropical regions. They wanted to bring in BT brinjal. We fought against it because India has more than 60 varieties of brinjal. Tamil Nadu has more than 22 varieties of brinjal. National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources claims 5,440 uh, 5, accessions of brinjal. But uh, in spite of all that, the government of India has brought in a new regulation that is going to be tried again. Oh, it's going wow. to be tried in seven states. It's already been published in newspapers on the beginning of this month. Uh, they're going to try BT Prinjal. They wanted to bring in mustard, and cleverly they play it up. BT, mm -hmm. BT is for Bacillus thuringiensis, not for biotechnology. BT is mm -hmm. for Bacillus thuringiensis. And uh, incidentally, mustard, they wanted to bring it as hybrid. So they called it as Dhara mustard hybrid. So people, you know, like when we started speaking against uh, Dhara mustard hybrid, then most of my farmers ignored and they said, sir, uh, it is after all hybrid. Why are you fighting against hybrid? Hybrid, you said, is OK, because at the moment we don't have other seeds. Mm. Yes, it is hybrid, but it is a hybrid of genetically modified parent. Mm. And they have not called it as BT and because they, don't they have mention used, it. Oh. Uh, because they have used bacillus uh, amylolipifaceans. They have not used bacillus uh, thuringiensis. Mm -hmm. There's another technology okay. called Barnes Bar Star technology, where you, by genetic modification, you become you make uh, a parent uh, one of the parent as uh, uh, you you mutant form where only a bisexual flower functions as a unisexual flower, where the male gametes are made as functionless. Mm -hmm. And okay. then you know, what is it? So it's the mm -hmm. Barnes Bar technology, and they would like to bring in herbicide tolerant plants through these sources so that they mm -hmm. set it up as a package. So hmm. yeah, whether it was glyphosate with uh, your uh, uh, cotton, BT cotton, Roundup uh, pesticides, or it's going to be Basta. Basta has uh, glucose in it. All these, all these are herbicide tolerant, and uh, they will ha definitely have an impact. Even for local treatment, they wanted to immediately make use of malathion and spray malathion all, all over. We had enough problems with endosulfan and palakkad and other places, but now hmm. malathion to be area sprayed. And unfortunately, oh. malathion uh, oh, wow. uh, molecules are bigger in size and will not affect the locust. Unless mm -hmm. you spray it with a, a huge box sprayer, which uh, completely disseminates in smaller molecular sizes, oh, yeah, right. it will be of no use. So mm -hmm. like, uh, just blindly doing things mm -hmm. uh, as a sort of a topographical treatment, but long term effects can be very punishing on the environment. So there's uh, still a very, very strong push for GMOs and for more chemical agriculture then I mean, naturally naturally yeah, because yeah. The way, as as we move towards corporatization that is what will happen mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, corporates have to put up their bills, and for the bills, they want money, and for money, and uh, in the name of saving the farmer, they're saving themselves. It's not for the farmer. Farmer, yeah. finally, you know, like in the policies, in case even if the corporates want to bring it, if the choice is given to the farmer, then it would be better. But the farmer may not have a choice. That's why they are bringing contract farming. In contract right. farming, the corporate declares what should be used, when should be used, at what dose mm -hmm. it should be used. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, his own right goes away in that case. Yeah, maybe I'm afraid that even loans given to farmers, farmers' loans which are given, mm -hmm. may carry a tag with them saying that you got to use this, this, this oh, as oh, a loan. Oh, mm -hmm. right. It mm -hmm. may, it may. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm forcing it. And uh, so far, whatever I have forced in with these damages has come true. So mm -hmm. even the loan will go with it. That uh, we can sanction a loan provided you have a guarantee. And the guarantee can come only with you use this soil, uh, this particular seed with this particular pesticide, with this particular fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Only then I can give you the loan. Otherwise, I am not sure whether you will be paid. Yeah. Things like that can come. Mm -hmm. So in countering this, you basically work with local organizations to teach people about organic farming. And yeah. I mean, that's how you kind of go about doing yeah, it. Yeah, I that's myself your... don't go because I have no time and the infrastructure for it. Yeah. Uh, people like Narsana or Padmaji yeah. or here, lots of institutions here, now online talking to farmers, yeah. making them aware, make them feel comfortable first and then making them aware. Yeah. Hmm. Even with food, the colorations in food, the additions in food, aspartames in food, mm -hmm. uh, monosodium glutamates, colors, like uh, dangerous colors which are used in food coloring. Yeah. So all, 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 all these problems we are trying to highlight, bring it to the knowledge of people. Even right. tomorrow I'm going to address the Nutrition Society of Bangalore. Ah, oh. wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, so you talk on that also, on yeah. additives. Yeah. Addit Chemical wow. additives in food. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Huge. Yeah, like you mentioned, you know, the, the GMOs and all these are not only affecting the environment, but also the health, right, in a way. So, I mean, how do you, I mean, we are in a big health crisis right now. So how do you see ourselves navigating through this? Or is there, uh, like, what do, what do we see at the end of this? GMOs, actually, again, you know, like we concentrated only with reference to human health. We never bothered that even the cow which eats that uh, uh, BT oil cake uh, puts the droppings and the droppings may carry certain proteins and uh, can affect the local microorganisms and the biota of that region as well. Right. So, and uh, the problem is when you use a HT plant uh, in, in a Western environment, anything that grows along with the main crop is called as a weed. Whereas in India, anything that grows with the main crop need not be a weed. It might be a sag, it might be a part of a cooking material. So right. how this gene jumping uh, can uh, contaminate those plants, we, we do not know. Our experiment should be entirely different. I should have a different approach altogether. Uh, the lateral migration of genes, the horizontal migration of genes can take place and all those things. About food, yes, food, uh, you talk about probably you had COVID in mind. But yeah. uh, uh, to my, I, I was going through some literature which many learned people from some of the other countries have worked out. And they relate COVID also as an incident of uh, environmental disruption. Right. And, uh, what occurs to me uh, as a person reading those and putting my own thoughts into it is uh, what happens is there is a forest. And in the forest, you find a lot of uh, microorganisms. They may be pests, they may be parasites, they may be anything, which are dependent on mammals, uh, big mammals like elephants or whatever mammals they may be, including the bats. And then human beings, we finally decide that we are going to have a big road through the forest and we cut down the forest. And all the big mammals start moving away from that because they don't like human interference in their system. They may once in a way come with a human-animal conflict, but they move away. And uh, gradually, once the roads are laid, then there will be a tea shop coming in, then there is a restaurant coming in, then the plots come in and human beings reside. And uh, they look for a very easily susceptible mammal and uh, we are the susceptible mammals who would... Uh, uh, actually be exposing ourselves to more disease. And these are called as zoonotic diseases, yeah. zoonosis. And it's predicted that the future is going to be dominated by zoonotic diseases because of these sort of interventions into the natural environment. So that's yeah. going to be another big uh, problem which we will have to think about. Uh, all, all this can, uh, that's the reason why we don't, uh, we should not hereafter talk about uh, 
organic farming, natural farming, permaculture, this and that. We must talk about sustainable farming and sustainable living. We must talk about uh, how best we can uh, create an environment for the next generation to take over. We won't be able to provide it to them, but at least they will have a sort of a thread through which they can move ahead and proceed yeah. uh, in that direction. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I I had one like basic question. If I mean, he's pretty much answered everything else we had here. Uh, so now, right now, there's a lot of reverse migration, right? A lot of uh, urban people are learning about these best practices and want to give it a shot. Uh, moving to rural areas, everyone wants their little farm and, you know, somewhere mm -hmm. they can hide from if, uh, you know, this pandemic really hits hard. So uh, can you define who a farmer is? Like, what are the qualities a farmer should have? How does one call himself a farmer? Uh, I know that not everybody has a you know education in farming. Like our Raitaru are very proud uh, by calling themselves Raitaru. So, do you have? Would you would would you have like a two liner, three liner about who should be a farmer? Before that, I would like to tell that long back we had a wonderful vice chancellor who wanted that every student should go into the rural area and work. Hmm. Uh, we asked him as to why, sir. He said. Uh, they should go and teach, uh, they, they should go and learn farming and other things from the villagers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, some of us said, uh, I hope they don't go and contaminate the villagers with their thoughts and their own way of living rather mm -hmm. than what's happening. So, you know, like this reverse migration, owning a farm is different from a farmer doing a farm. Mm -hmm. Very few educated people want to unlearn and learn farming. They are farmers, but mm -hmm. some who want to own a farm are not mm -hmm. farmers. Mm -hmm. The one who wants to own a farm is only for luxury, for his resort like, and engage people to do farming, sit, mm -hmm. down, sit down and works out on all the things. Once in a way, drives a tractor for the fun of it and uh, advises based on internet uh, input. I would not classify that person as a farmer. I would uh, consider that person as somebody who is eco friendly. A farmer okay. is one who has put his hands and feet into the soils and has worked over the period of years with his traditional wisdom which he uses. In fact, okay. to my knowledge, uh, knowing some of the people here who have purchased such lands and doing having farms, they actually uh, learn from the people who work over there and uh, they, they are not able to contribute much knowledge about it. They mm -hmm. are people, you, you, I think, uh, Janani, it's a right time that, as you said, we should have a third category of people now to be classified. People mm -hmm. who are interested in farming, mm -hmm. they are not farmers okay. themselves. They are interested in farming, who own mm -hmm. farms and who want to do something. But the okay. cool way is to call yourself a farmer because you come under a different bracket under the Income Tax Act. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, for land holdings and all that. <laughs> for the power consumption, for water, for everything, yeah. <laughs> True. Wow. Okay. Uh, just uh, one more question, then we can just start wrapping up. But uh, I wondered your thoughts on um, on cities in general. Um, any thoughts or advice to people who live in you know urban situations and how they can start living more consciously with nature? What your thoughts are on cities? Yeah. What one thing I could see after this COVID in the past eight or nine months, because I live on the East Coast Road here in Chennai. Okay. Uh, on which you find a lot of nurseries. Mm -hmm. There's a huge crowd of cars in front of nurseries. Yep. And uh, I, I, I feel a lot of people gradually moving into small, small farming. Whether mm -hmm. it's a beautiful garden or mm -hmm. they're setting small terrace gardens, kitchen gardens, and uh, uh, terrace gardening is picking up. That's a very, yeah. very positive sign. Uh, yeah. what, what many people, you know, they have a wrong concept about terrace gardening. They think that terrace mm -hmm. gardening means I'll get all the vegetables for me for throughout the year, 365 days a year for my terrace. It's not possible. It's a sort of a life yeah. which you start doing. And even if you can harvest uh, two or three bhendis in a week, yeah. be happy yeah. about it and enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that has started picking up now. In fact, yeah. many mm -hmm. people call me up and say, sir, we have an old terrace. Can we do terrace gardening? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I tell them, don't worry, you, the last wall is a boundary wall, which is a load-bearing wall. From there, within three feet, you can put some uh, trellises. And on these trellises, you can have some bags. And the bags, you grow. 
I happened to visit a recent workshop just as a participant out of curiosity, and they were saying, "Don't use poly bags." I said, "Are bhai, jo use karna hai, karne do na." Yeah, yeah. Start with something. You know, like exactly. uh, anyway, right? uh, whatever you have at home, dabba, dagra. In hmm. fact, one of my students' uh, experiment, which worked out very well, was she uses these coconut shells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, so sir. There are plenty over here in Tamil Nadu and Kerala and all. Coconut is being used, and the shells empty shell. You mm. make a small hole, put a little mm. bit of soil and little compost, mix it up, and mm. grow methi in it. Once in a fortnight, have methi sabzi at home. Mm. <laughs> uh, balcony is <laughs> enough for it. So you know, mm. like uh, space is not a constraint, and uh, seeds, almost about uh, twelve to fifteen seeds are available in the kitchen. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, methi yeah. is there, somph is there, all these microgreens. There are so many. Seeds over there, caught even potato. You buy, you can take the eye, something will come. Onion, you can put, you can spring onions. Lahasan, yeah. uh, they start growing, you can use the spring uh, thing. So, there yeah. are almost 15 seeds in your kitchen, and there mm. is enough space over it. Just develop mm. some space in your heart and contact with your my head and see to it that you <laughs> know something which becomes good enough for you to relish. Uh, that, that's a very good thing which has started, actually. Yeah. But I would appreciate if they can manage their own waste and see to it that uh, compost is used over there. That would be a good mm -hmm. sign. Few mm -hmm. people have started, but all are still not uh, interested in it. I mm -hmm. hope more people will come into it. City people, my humble request is uh, many people ask me uh, this uh, climate change, what can I do for it? I tell them that uh, even if you use a two wheeler or a four wheeler, use it, but maintain it. Mm -hmm. Internet, service mm -hmm. it, air check mm -hmm. it regularly. These yeah. are the small things these people can do. And uh, for children, please motivate them to grow a plant. And those parents who would want their children to grow plants, my simple, humble request is the first plant you give, let it be Ajwain, the mm -hmm. Indian Borash. Yeah. The Indian Borash. We call it as Karpuravalli because mm -hmm. even if the child neglects it, it will, mm. it will grow. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It grows, the child will be happy. I have grown. I will start <laughs> growing more. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, lovely. Yeah. Great. Lovely. So, um, yeah. Any more? Um, anything I think we, want we I, I think we would. Uh, so, I mean, this is like a. Okay, anyway, I'll ask this question. What do you feel about uh, are some of the key areas humankind needs to work on right now? I mean, what is it that's on the top of your mind that you feel like, okay, if this is solved, we can solve a bunch of other things? Uh, all through, uh, we have had a big mouth. So let us shut up our mouth and open our ears and listen to nature rather than talk to nature. Super. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That is a, like that literally yeah, yeah. one of the one yeah. solution fits every problem sort of one solution. Every <laughs> problem. Yeah. Brilliant. I think we'll 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 quote that in the video. Yeah. I think that'll be the title of the nature, video. Nature, nature, <laughs> nature always nature always gives sounds and signals. Yeah. Sounds are audible. Tsunami is audible. Storm is audible. Torpedo is audible. And then we wake up. Yeah. Signals are mild. Let us wake up to signals now. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, yeah. Which is the, which is one of the first principles of permaculture. Also, it's like observe and interact. So, which, yes. which, which is so I mean obvious, but it's also uh, yeah. It is obvious that people interact before observing. Yeah. yeah always. <laughs> yeah. Even after attending a permaculture workshop, if somebody wants to go, they go predetermined. I saw that in the farm. I would like to have that in my farm. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, I tell many gardeners who want to have home gardens, I tell them, don't go and do something which you want. You allow what the soil wants. Right. In my home, I have a variety. I can uh, uh, WhatsApp to Kerry to forward it up. I think it's on my phone. Mm. Some of the videos I just forward it. You can just forward it to Janani and oh, that would be lovely, Please. Uh, please yeah. Have a look at it. So anything that grows, grows. It doesn't grow, it doesn't grow. That's all over. So what? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Most believe some days back, one guy wanted some advice. So he came all the way. He was brought by a colleague of mine from another college. This lady called up and said, this man is a good friend of mine. He wants information, Sultan, please help. So they came. And he came. He discussed about his soil in the highlands and other things. 
and while going he said sir i grow vanilla i did not bring anything for you can i give you a vanilla sapling i know that it will not grow here but would you like to have one i said okay give it there were just two leaves on it hmm. today it's about 8 feet tall growing beautifully <laughs> No, I, I, I don't know how it happened. It's growing. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's okay. But I'll get a pod and then have an original vanilla. <laughs> wow, <laughs> brilliant. I love things to grow. Uh, the, uh, seeing these videos because I use them in my presentation for the local media. And uh, mm-hmm. one person calls up and says, "Can I come to your house and take one small handful of soil from your garden for my soil?" <laughs> 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 एक मुट्ठी मिट्टी हमें दे दो आप डॉक्टर सर आई थिंक व्हिच व्हिच लीड्स मी टू बी वन क्वेश्चन दैट दैट आई वांट टू आस्क यू आल्सो व्हाट व्हाट आर योर थॉट्स ऑन नेटिव एंड नॉन नेटिव स्पीशीज बिकॉज़ समटाइम्स द नॉन नेटिव स्पीशीज काइंड ऑफ ग्रो बाय देमसेल्व्स एंड यू नो एट देयर काइंड आई मीन सम ऑफ देम ऑब्वियसली आर इनवेसिव एंड ऑल ऑफ दैट एंड दे आल्सो डिस्ट्रॉय द इकोसिस्टम यू वांट टू वेयर आर यू फ्रॉम Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from here. I'm from here. Yeah, I'm from Bangalore. So you are from Bangalore, yeah, right? Yeah. And Janani? I'm also from Bangalore. Yeah. Janani, where are you staying? I'm also from Bangalore. But, All yeah. the Bangalore people. Okay. <laughs> very, very local. So, <laughs> example I give uh, Imanchu is, supposing uh, a friend of mine who has come from Delhi and I, we take a train. and we are traveling by second class ordinary coach in the month of november december the train crosses uh, chennai tamil nadu border enters into andhra border i will start taking my sweater out mm. <laughs> whereas my friend will not take till it reaches nagpur right mm. because he is an ecotype mm. he is an ecotype even among the same species ecotypes mm. have an influence Mm. so every every ecosystem has their own ecotypes so mm. they have a strong value like for example if you buy uh, if you bring a mongrel home you just tie it out or leave it open in the open uh, your ba- uh, house uh, compound and uh, you take it uh, small uh, any plastic uh, plate and you you even give thair sadam curd mm. rice that will mm. eat wag his tail and go away mm. but if you buy a labrador or anything like that do you do it mm. same thing when we buy anything exotic we have to mm. create an environment which is exotic for them mm. whereas an endemic has its own values there's a reason mm. why endemics have their own benefits that's mm. that's what i indirectly said how this particular species mm. uh, eudrilus eugeni which this professor in her book claims I brought this from Germany. I don't know mm. how she has the atrocity to write it, and how the government of India is quite our, our speech is being brought out, brought in without mm. any uh, permission or anything like that. Today, yeah. my home, mm. I, I I used to have cultures of Peronix and Lampito completely mm. replaced by them automatically because I get cow dung from outside, mm. and they are such voracious pests actually, mm. and mm. all this. compare between them if i take mm. an indian variety epigeic variety that is surface variety like perionex it not mm. only eats and shits but it also takes soil little bit of it it improves my soil mm-hmm. whereas mm-hmm. all this topic whether it is icenia or idrilus just mm. eats and shits. it doesn't take oh. soil it doesn't improve the soil oh so, okay so you know like they can they can function they they can they can show to your eye that they are working but Mm. how mm. does it impact my soil mm. you are adding manure but and mm. more what happens when they start multiplying and if you start releasing them in the open space where there is more mulch they will start mm. working on the mulch and they eat so fast and reproduce and excrete mm. you know like uh, i joking jokingly every time i tell no organism lives likes to live in its own shit mm-hmm. so when when the these worms eat and excrete fast the local mm. worms don't like that shit so they start mm. moving away mm. okay uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so this complexities of exotic endemic people are not able to understand they immediately mm. go into a sort of a retaliation because mm. they have done it and they take it as i have done so it is right 
Uh, mm. right. This I attended at a PPST conference in IIT Bombay as early as 1979, 80. Mm -hmm. To the same professor. Mm. But uh, she worked for the university, so she gets the benefits. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Because in my country, one thing which I must very sadly say that it is not what I know that matters; it is whom I know that matters. Mm. Yeah, you can say that again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I know doesn't matter. Whom I know matters. Yeah, that's true. Sadly. So. That has to change, and I hope the next generation will change it. Then next. Um, Kiri? OK, My boss? internet is uh, something happening. It keeps free freezing. It, it keeps telling. It keeps, it keeps freezing you. At least the internet is freezing. The temperatures are warm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah. Uh, do you, okay, one question is just uh, just to end with, do you feel hopeful about the future? I have always been an optimist. Yeah. <laughs> Not an optimist, <laughs> yeah, the reality. Yeah, the reality. Yeah, it will be good for the future. Everything yeah. will be fine for the future because my strong belief, because I work with children and youth, there is a zeal and enthusiasm in them. So mm -hmm. identify what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm Sure that they will be able to bring a change and there will be a change and that could be the new normal. Wonderful. Lovely. Okay. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay then. Thank, thank, you, thank you so, thank you so much. much. Thank you so much. Bye then. Good luck. I mean, you post it so in the link so that I will have a look at it and forward it. Of course. It. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't I behave like a typical media people. Media people always say, of course, yes, and they forget. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Always. <laughs> it's a pleasure talking to you. Uh, yeah, thank really you. Thank you, yeah. Thank, yeah. You, yeah. thank you, Jenoni, and thank you, Kerry. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye, sir.